I would like to introduce our next speaker, Father Jean Damour, Duzen Gumuremi. Father Jean Damour is, uh, was ordained to the priesthood in 2013 for the Diocese of Biumba in Rwanda. He researches Rwandan martyrs from all the corners of the country. He is a leading expert on the life of Felicite and initiated the Felicite Ni Itegeta, Tegeka Foundation in Rwanda. He was instrumental in the preservation of the Centre Saint-Pierre, the, the very building where Felicite hid and cared for refugees as a historical site in Rwanda. Father Jean de Mour is dedicated to offering new ways of reflecting on the church's witness to the flourishing of human life, both in Rwanda and the world at large. Father Jean de Mour has a great interest in liturgical music with the aim to promote active particip participation of the assembly in liturgical celebrations and in other Christian gatherings. He has compiled and published three liturgical hymnals which are used liturgical celebrations in liturgical celebrations in Rwanda. Please. Good afternoon. Uh, my presentation is about the role of popular liturgical music in promoting active participation in liturgy in Rwanda. I chose this topic because I grew up singing and my identity was shaped by music especially the sacred music. My vocation to priesthood was also nourished by sacred songs and my way of praying, I use songs when I'm happy or sad. The second reason to choose this topic is that Rwanda is a singing country. We sing our joys, our, joys, our pains, our sorrows, our failures, our achievements. We sing our holiness and our sinfulness. We sing peace, we sing war, we sing life, and the life sings us. Unfortunately, music was used as an instrument during the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. The music was used to incite people to commit the genocide. One of the greatest talented musicians of Rwanda was condemned uh, to life, impri to impri to life imprison imprisonment because of uh, his use of uh, songs to incite people to hatred, which is sad. Another great musician who is Catholic and whose uh, songs influence our worship, our worship has also been condemned to life imprisonment for his role, the, the role he played in the genocide. This is also sad. Uh, however, we do have other musicians whose contribution helped us to, to pray and to cultivate our faith in God. My presentation is uh, based especially on the document of the Second Vatican Council, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and also on my findings, because I am very interested in promoting uh, liturgical uh, uh, music, mu music in my country. This is the la latest uh, uh, publication I made, and I gathered all the songs, okay, most of the songs we use in our liturgies in this book. So that's why I am interested in this topic. One of the major outcomes of the Second Vatican Council was to allow indigenous, indigenous people to use their own languages and to also introduce some of their cultural elements in liturgies. The Sacrosanctum Concilium document is all about the liturgical reformation in the Catholic Church. This decision played the role of Talita Kumu and Efata, this is what <laughs> I imagined, for indigenous people, for indigenous people, because before the Second Vatican Council, most of the people who participated in the liturgy 
could not speak nor understand Latin, which was the main language recommended for liturgical celebrations. However, the fact of not speaking nor understanding Latin was not a big issue because the native language of liturgy is body language. In other words, liturgy is more about what we do than what, than what we speak or we say. By allowing the use of vernacular language, languages in the liturgy, the conciliar father wanted the liturgy to be a space where everyone feels welcomed and allow, allowed to actively participate. The importance of the assembly in the Eucharist, in the Eucharistic liturgy was to be emphasized in calling God's people together as a worshiping body not as a collection of individuals. When the Second Vatican Council published the Sacrosanctum Concilium document with an emphasis on the use of vernacular languages, some theologians thought that, that the next step was to translate uh, the manual, manuals, missals, and other liturgical uh, documents in order to bring about the active uh, participation of God's people in liturgy. I was fascinated by the remark and the challenge that Guardini raised up uh, to the German Congress on liturgy at Mainz when he said, is the liturgical act a forgotten way of doing things? This was a pertinent co question at that time after the Vat the Second Vatican Council, which wanted to reform the liturgy throughout the entire church. In raising this question, Guardini might have been motivated by the fact that most of the theologians were trying to make uh, that post, to make that post -conci conciliar reform happen through the liturgical tools such as missals, breviaries, cate catechesis, in terms of text and verbal instructions that Catholic, Catholics all over the world had to follow. Instead of insisting on what people had to do and how to do it with their bodies, because liturgy is first expressed through rites and not through the words. And if the words appear in liturgy, is because those words are part of the right. I agree with Guardini because in Rwanda, just after the, 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 the council, uh, the Second Vatican Council, we had most of the documents, liturgical documents, translated in our native language, Kinyarwanda. But the active participation of God's people in liturgy was not yet achieved. What was missing? According to what I was told by the Rwandan old priest, the full active participation in liturgy started to be observed and experienced with Im the emergence of popular liturgical songs in Kinyarwanda later in 1975, 10 years just after the council. Throughout my reflection, I will discuss the significance of popular liturgical music in Rwanda by showing its importance not only in liturgy, but also in the evangelization of Rwanda. I will also raise up some issues or challenges generated by this liturgical movement and propose some practical solutions. The purpose of sacred music. The, council, the Second Vatican Council reaffirmed the importance and the purpose of the sacred music in liturgy, which is to glorify God and to sanctify the faithful. Sacred music is a is a first a prayer. In the Bible, we find the songs in forms in form in form of prayer and praise, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There are some uh, biblical books which are entirely made by songs or canticles, uh, like the book of Psalms. Psalms were all, 
or always a song. We have also other parts of the Bible like Magnificat of the Virgin Mary, Nunc Dumitus by Simeon, and others. In the early church, singing was appreciated as the most beautiful way of worshiping God. We know what St. Augustine said about the beauty and the riches of a prayer expressed through the song, Qui bene eh, cantat bis orat. The Second Vatican Council reaffirmed the importance of songs in liturgy. Liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly in songs with the assistance of sacred ministers and the active participation of God's people. Sacro Sanctum Concilium, number 113. There are other many resources with, uh, which testify to the importance and uh, the purpose of sacred music as a part of liturgy. This is the reason why the Second Vatican Council emphasized, it, emphasized the significance of songs to encourage active participation of God's people in the Eucharist. Yet the assembly gathers first, first of all for worship as members of the body of Christ. Our very assembling is our first act of worship. This means that once we assemble, everyone becomes a member of that community and to be a real member of that community uh, supposes participating in the very life of the community you belong to when it comes to liturgy, every member of the assembly is supposed to partake in what is done. If there is one who doesn't participate, he or she becomes like a stranger to his or her own community. To address, to address this challenge, then I, I, I move to the role of popular songs to address this challenge in promoting active participation in liturgy in Rwanda. As we have said uh, above, uh, the translation of liturgical materials could not provide a magical solution to the question of active participation in, the liturgy, in liturgy, because liturgy is what we do and not what we say. In Rwanda, even after the translation of important liturgical documents, the problem of active participation was not solved. Through, though Rwandans could understand and speak uh, in their very native language during the liturgies, the liturgy remained a kind of chord. Chord was not vivid, yeah. Uh, the first Rwandan priest who learned and knew music from missionaries had composed songs in Kinyarwanda, but they followed Western and Gregorian style, which totally, which is totally, which are totally different from the Rwandan spirit. The nature of the tradition, the, the the Rwandan traditional music. They are various in. There are variations in traditional Rwandan music, including instrumental, vocal, vocal instrumental, and vocal instrumental with dancing. Vocal music is associated, associated with songs that relate to historical events, royalty, heroes, and love. Pastoral songs, hunting song, songs, popular music, songs or stories that, that teach moral lessons all also belong to this vocal category. The combination of drums and various instruments without song is classified as instrumental music. Rwandan music also can be classified in three main categories. First, indirimbo. Indirimbo, when we, we say indirimbo, is, is a song in general. It's a song, every song is indirimbo. Uh, first, indirimbo are songs which are meant only 
for listening and enjoyment. enjoyment. They are vocal and produced mainly in the, the, in the Kinyarwanda language, in our mother tongue. Second is imjino, are songs for dancing. When we have a song and we dance, we call them imjino. The songs are rendered to allow a slow dancing pattern in which the dancer strikes the ground which his or her feet in accordance to the rhythm of the song. One form of imjino attempts to educate about marriage in that it, uh, it, is, it uh, revolves around the life of a woman as a wife and her role in the family. Other forms of imjino include the inore, ichinimba, ichinimba dances. The third are ibitekerezo, which are sung poetry or stories that are accompanied by uh, an instrument. Written uh, in verses, the songs were learned by heart, by heart and transmitted in the original form, hence, they form part of the oral literature of Rwanda. These include praise songs, uh, praise songs, songs about cows and dynastic poems. We sing for cows because a cow, a cow in my culture is sacred. So there is literature about cow. After studying the spirit of the traditional Rwandan music, missionaries, concluded that in order to encourage the active participation in liturgy, there might be an initiative to compose popular liturgical songs following the traditional, the traditional Rwandan music. What I call popular liturgical uh, song is a very song which is simple and easy to learn by God's people without necessarily being a member of the choir because the way, it, uh, the way it is composed touches the soul of the people who sing it. This meets also the, uh, the spirit of the Second Vatican Council in Sacrosanctum Concilium number 118 when they, the fathers said, religious singing by the people is to be intelligently fostered so that in devotions and sacred exercises and also during liturgical services, the voices of the faithful may ring out according to the norms and requirements of the rubrics. rubrics, rubrics. Popular songs are made with refrain and stanzas with simple music which allow people to learn, which allow people to learn them spontaneously. The Second Vatican Council asked religious mu musicians to, my God, to focus on simplicity while they compose sacred songs to be in liturgy. Composers, feel, composers filled with the Christian spirit should feel that their vocation Vocation, vocation is to cultivate sacred music and increase its store of treasure. Oh, my time is going. So maybe I will summarize the, 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 the rest of, uh, of my, my presentation. Um, when missionaries studied the style of uh, our traditional music, they call it musicians, our uh, musicians, especially as priests and the, uh, seminarians, to follow that style in order to come up with songs which, are, which speak to our soul. And so musicians responded to this call, and even those who are really great musicians accepted to compose uh, uh, those simple songs in order to allow people to participate in the research. I say this because uh, before um, there was a joke in this uh, 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 presentation where when the first song which was composed following our style, the composer uh, you know, tried to 
to make himself like everyone. And, and so the song attracted people when it was first sung, and many people came. And so the priest who told me the story told me, even the children, the babies who were uh, crying or uh, shouting, kept quiet and followed the melody because the melody spoke to them. And so this, uh, this, this style helped people to, attracted people to go to mass and to participate because in uh, our liturgies, songs play, play a great role uh, because we sing mass from the beginning to the end. Even in the creed, there is no part of mass which is not sung. Which is not sung. And so uh, this, ty th this kind of songs, which are, uh, these songs which are uh, popular, simple, help people even to, yeah, I see, even, even like to dance, to participate with their whole being. And so, like after the genocide, we used these songs to bring people again to the church. And during the genocide, the musicians also composed the songs which accompanied us in terms of hope, to give us hope, to give, they, they are like our psalms. If you read this book and uh, you analyze every song, you will know our history, what, what we went through, like the psalms. And like after the genocide, we composed, we sung, we, we, sing, we sung the, 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 the songs of joy, the songs of gratitude to God. So they are like our, our, our psalms, and they also incite people to participate. Because when they know that in a, in a church they will sing, they will dance, there you go, uh, as also a space of healing. And many songs also uh, were composed with the intention to help in evangelization in this, in that, that uh, um, uh, the, the missionaries asked uh, our musicians to compose songs uh, which like um, uh, speak uh, or summarize the gospel, summarize what we do in liturgy, especially in baptism and other sacraments. I don't know, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, there are many things about uh, uh, the role of uh, liturgical songs in a, a, a popular liturgical songs in a, in my in in Rwanda. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is that they help us to be attracted and to participate and to feel that we are part of what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Father Zhuang Um As an art form, music really, you know, it, you, don't, you don't have to articulate it intellectually in order to participate. You can just do. Mm. And I think to your point, when you brought up Guardini, it really helps to clarify what it means to actually just do as opposed to mm -hmm. explain. Thank you. So I'll take questions from the audience. Colleen. Um, so th thank you for your, your presentation, Father. Um, I'm, I'm curious about when the, the missionaries asked the Rwandan composers to, to write music and for, for the, the local context, did the, the composers like reuse existing melodies and put new text to it that echoed the, the Christian tradition? Or was it original works written in a popular style? They used or, original, uh, original melodies, but following okay. the style, in, uh, trying to interpret the spirit of Rwanda, the soul of Rwanda, the song that speaks to my soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Thank you. As a Rwandan, yeah. Thank you, Father John DeMore. So um, uh, Dr. Tan had spoken about uh, multiple belongings, and I wondered if there were cases in, in which uh, these Catholic songs are so attractive to the surrounding community that you also get Protestants, local Protestants, participating in aspects of the worship because the music is so attractive. 
Yeah, uh, I appreciate your question. Um, uh, yeah, th some uh, some songs, Catholic songs, attract protestant uh, because of the first of uh, the content and 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 the style, especially after the genocide. Uh, evangelical churches uh, came up with uh, a new style of singing, and the Catholic Church was like left behind. And our musician remarked that uh, challenge, and they also jumped in, and so they came up with other. Uh, melodies, uh, uh, you know, which match with the context. And so we have some like uh, songs that even Protestants uh, sing. But for us in our liturgies, we don't sing Protestant uh, uh, songs, unless, especially, uh, except during the ecumenical week, when we celebrate ecumenism, we, we sing their songs and they sing our songs. Thank you, Father Jean. Um, has any music been written about the martyrs? Has any music been written about the martyrs? Martyrs? The martyrs. Uh -huh. Sister Felicite. Maybe not used in liturgy, but. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Last, like two weeks ago, when I was reflecting on this topic, I composed a song in a, her memory and it's, it follows the same style. And when I sent it to Rwanda, I don't know, even on YouTube you see how people are interested in it because of the style. And the style I used is um, very, very traditional. And uh, I borrowed, I mean, I was influenced by another martyr who died and who was a musician, Rugamba Spirian. He's in uh, the process of beatification. And he influenced our liturgies and he influenced also our culture uh, because of his uh, like uh, talent in music. And so I followed, the, I mean, I followed his style and so people were happy to enjoy that. They told, oh, maybe he's risen again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, there is just one I, I, I made. Will you, will you sing it for us? Okay, <laughs> just like two. It's a long, but I can, I can sing. Or if you want, I have it on my computer, and I think it can just like two stanzas. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Father Jean, for an excellent presentation. And I think it's, a, it's an important presentation. As, as a musician, I love it when students speak about music, because music is theologia prima, the primary theology, and music has been how the census fidelity is expressed, the people. And even when there was plenty of Latin playing China, whatever, you know, throughout the Middle Ages, all throughout, everyone sang in the vernacular. We have our medieval European carols, the Villanchicos, the, the Corritos, you know, and all that music that expresses what the people actually felt, even when the liturgy was in Latin. So, and the one thing I think the, to stress that you may, because when we think of music in a Western context, it's always text and melodies. But I think I, when I went to Kenya for me on a mission, uh, missions conference and study trip, uh, going to a SVD mission in Kayole, you know, and experiencing the African mass, to see that music is embodied, is singing, the congre the, ass the assembly was dancing and moving and everything. The, the things that we don't get, because for us, when we think of music, it's always text and melody. And whereas in other cultures, in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, music is embodied. Music is who we are. Music is incarnational. Music flows. And I'm glad uh, we are working on that. Even if we are stuck with text, uh, that uh, has to be literally faithful to the Latin, at least in music, you know, we are free to embody, to incarnate the divine presence, not just in words or melodies, but in our movements, in how this music resonates. And I think that's why even babies and children kept quiet because that was the music that went to the core. Something that I think our enlightenment paradigm where we bifurcate mind, body, spirit, we have lost that in the West. And I think I will end by saying that that is a lesson that we in the West, in Europe, in North America can learn from Africans and Asians. Thank you. All right, let's take a short break. Um, we'll meet back here at 2.15. There's plenty of coffee, treats on the table. Thank you. <laughs>